bitte noch mal korrigiert werden. But now it's an honor for me to present you um, a man who is leading a network which was founded in 2006 by leading independence. A network to secure and fight for our independent interests, rights and values in the digital music space. It's a solidarity movement of over 600 members, including uh, 20,000 labels, helping all of us negotiating deals with multi-billion dollar companies and trying to settle copyright infringement cases for all of us. A network which was named fifth most innovative company in the global music industry by Fast Company magazine. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Charles Carlos of the global rights agency Merlin with a warm applause. Morning, everyone. So, uh, as Oka says, it's been it's been probably about six and a half years since we started operating uh, Merlin, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time with it. But I think it's important to to look at the background of of, of why Merlin exists and why it was started. And it's a question we still we still get asked quite a lot. You know, as Oka says, we're currently in a position where we have over 600 members representing 20,000 labels from around the world. We represent approximately 10% of the global digital music market, which is the biggest basket of rights outside of the, the, the four major labels. And, you know, since 2008, where we've started business, we, we've uh, not only signed global licensing deals on behalf of our members, with leading new generation digital music services such as Spotify, Deezer, Beats Music, Google Play, Audio, and, and, and so on. But we've also protected the rights of our members where they've been infringed. So we've successfully sued companies like LimeWire and GrooveShark and returned in excess of $10 million to the independent sector that they wouldn't have got there in the first place. And I think those two things lead back to the question of the formation of Merlin and where it came from. You know, the independent sector has always been a healthy and vibrant sector. It's always been an, an innovative sector. It's always brought new musical styles, new genres, new artists to the marketplace. It, it, it has, a, it has a, a, a vision that goes back to the beginning of our industry and has led that industry. At the same time, and as the market digitized in, in the early 2000s, and we went from a global network of, of, of physical companies that worked with each other, and the distribution and the consumption of music, music became global, the, glo the companies that had global reach had a natural advantage in the marketplace, which were the major labels. So the more digital the market got, at least in the early stages, the more difficult it became for independence to, to get the attention of companies. Even a big label in Germany was going to struggle to get an, the attention of, of iTunes in the first year before it even had Germany in its sights, even though they, there was a potential market there for them. And at the same time, the, 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 the trade bodies that were there supposedly representing our interests in terms of infringement were being sidelined because it was becoming more profitable for the big record companies to sue companies like Kazar and Napster directly and take the money for themselves. So even though independents were members of those bodies and, and their rights were being equally infringed, they were, they were being you know, sidelined. So really, I, th I think the, the, the first things I did when I started in my job was really take a look at, at the state of the market and what the challenges and what the opportunities are. And in preparing for, for, for this, it made me think that really the shape of the market has changed, but the challenges and opportunities remain pretty much the same. So I think, you know, if we look back at, at, at the way independents have struggled to get in the market in the old world, in a world dominated by physical retail where there was only a certain number of slots in every record shop, it was difficult as a new entrant to the market to get your music actually in front of consumers. And those, the, the, the channels of radio and television and newspapers and press and marketing favoured those with the most money. And the major labels built an incredibly successful business on dominating those channels and driving consumers to where they needed them to be, so that when you walked into media market, you saw the artist that was on television last week and who was in the press and who was probably doing a concert. There was, you know, it was very tightly controlled. The, the exciting thing about the digital revolution is it's flattened that entry space enormously. 
Uh, you know, whereas there used to be one door to get into media market and to walk into the record store, you had to see the Lady Gaga and the Katy Perry display, even if you might have been into, I don't know, Cannibal Corpse or Napalm Death or something, you still had to, to walk there. Um, the, the way the digital market works is you can actually walk into the door that leads directly to where you're interested, and as a label you can put your music where you think that people are going to find it. And the ubiquitous availability of music on all of these platforms has created an, an enormous amount of opportunity uh, for, for, for labels, and independent labels in particular. So, so this I just wanted to show, because this shows the reality of, of Merlin's business only with a small number of our new generation streaming partners over the last two and a half years. Uh, and these are global figures, but I think they should really illustrate the enormous growth that we've seen in the digital space and in the digital streaming space in particular over the last two, two, two and a half years. You know, we've gone from earning just under or just on $2 million a month for, for the Merlin members to close to $11 million in June this year. And year on year, we, we paid our members $89 million in the 12 months ending March this year. That was more than double for the 12-month uh, period before that and more than double the 12-month period before that. So I think what we're seeing is even in, in, in challenging times where, you know, and I think we, we, we acknowledge that there's challenging times and there's a, there's a shift in the dynamic of the marketplace and navigating uh, new technologies is, is a difficult and sometimes complicated uh, thing to do, I don't think we should ever lose sight of the potential and, and, and what is there. And the thing about these numbers that we show when we talk to independent labels is to say, you know, th th this growth and this opportunity and this level of business is now available to anyone who can actually actively participate in that. So it's, it's become easier for you to put your music where consumers can find it. And we've seen it in the, the, the research that we've done. So, so you know, Merlin's revenues have, have grown significantly. Uh, we did a member survey earlier this year that looked at trying to get a real global picture of what the digital business looked like for independent labels around the world. And we surveyed our members in, I think, 42, uh, f uh, 39 countries. Uh, with varying levels of adoption of new, new kinds of technologies and new kinds of, of streaming services. Half of those people said that between 2013 and 12, their business has more, had, had more than doubled. Half of them also said that in the same period, their a la carte download business had increased. Three quarters of them said that their overall business had increased year on year. Um, and three quarters of them also said that they were optimistic about the future of their business which seems to go against the perceived wisdom of what we're reading and hearing in the press about what, you know, how much trouble this industry is in. I think that, you know, people who are in trouble in this industry are the people who are not adapting and not grasping these opportunities that are in front of them. And these numbers that come from independent labels that, that we've uh, that, that are members of Merlin also are playing out in commercial measures. We looked at chart performance um, in a number of territories with our members. Um, and I did a presentation earlier this year in the UK uh, alongside the uh, official chart company, which is the company that produces the charts every year. And basically we both looked at the, the, the charts and the streaming market over the past, you know, I think eight years in the UK. And the thing that, that struck us both was that as the market became more digital and as these streaming services became more mainstream within the marketplace, the more success independents were having in the charts to the point where the figure, the year where we had our highest figures for uh, digital, digital music in, 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 in the UK was the same year that independent labels performed the best in the mainstream charts. So I think you know that we're starting to see this picture that the flattening of access to the to, to these models, and the the ubiquity of music and the availability of music and the fact that as a label you can now use Facebook and Twitter and your direct interaction with your fans and your own website, and all of those those day-to-day -day interactions to actually drive people to listen to your music now. 
You know, I used to run a record label and distribution company and we'd spend tens of thousands of dollars trying to get music onto the radio so that maybe 10 or 20,000 people could hear it and then maybe try and work out if they were buying it, if people liked it or not. If you're smart, today you can get 10,000 people to listen to your song today and you'll know by the end of the day whether they like that song or not. You'll be able to see if they share it, if they click out of it. So, so, so the, the, the tools available to us and to available to the market as a whole are, are incredible and it feels to me like the independents are leading the, the, the vanguard in that. Which brings us, you know, so, so that's all the, the, the fantastic opportunity we're seeing and, you know, we're, we're seeing, we're projecting this growth to continue at this rate into the foreseeable future. You know, services like Beats are yet to come into the market. We're seeing new entrants coming into this space which will hopefully you know, drive additional value and see these numbers increase more and more. And I think we have seen you know, recently, uh, and I know that Germany is earlier in the digital transition than, than other territories are, but I think we do have to look at the examples of territories like Norway and Denmark, where their, their, their music economy is totally flipped to a digital economy. And we're actually seeing those markets return overall to growth so within that industry, the overall industry is growing. I think Norway grew 11% year on year at the same time that I think one in 10 Norwegian people use or have a Spotify account. So I think this notion of scale and volume and sustainability uh, is, is something we also have to learn because I think the, the much as this graph shows earnings over time, that very closely reflects what happens within territories as well. So when you break down and look at what happens within a territory to digital earnings for labels, you know, the transition phase is scary. There's a lot of usage, there's little monetization, and really the money starts to come when these products become more mainstream, when mobile phone companies bundle these products with, with, with their plans, where um, you know, the level of, of conversion and adoption becomes higher, and then all of a sudden the numbers start to make an, an awful lot more sense. And I do sense that in a, in a, in a country like Germany that's so technologically savvy and has such a, a history of, of, of having a strong and healthy uh, music market, uh, this growth and these kind of statistics should be giving labels operating within this market a lot of optimism. And I think I'm sure a lot of the percentage those, of those three quarters of the, the people who, who said to Merlin that they were optimistic in our business are in these markets where you're just starting to, to, to sense the development. But you know, that, that also brings us to, to, to challenges. So um, as the market grows and as independents perform better, it must mean that other forms of consumption are performing worse and other companies are performing worse. And I think that the, the concentration in the marketplace of major labels down from five to four to, to three that we have now is a significant challenge, not only for, for, the, for the independent sector, but I think for, for the market as a whole. Because so I think we're now in a world where the incentives are misaligned. As I said, I think that the, the market works very well for the major labels where they could control all of those uh, consumers and get them to go where they wanted them and really shape the market. New digital services are practically uncontrollable. There is no shop window anymore. You know, consumers are free to, to go in and out where, where, they, where they like. And I think what we're seeing is, is you know, as, as there's this evolution, there's also an almost a devolution um, both commercially and strategically by some of the bigger companies who are either trying to create services in the image of what the market used to look like or are trying to stifle some of that innovation and weight the cards in their favour so that the world looks the way it, it used to look. You know, we always use the example of, you know, the, the first two meetings I took when I started at Merlin, one was with Spotify and one was with MySpace. You know, Spotify in those six or seven years has become the leading... Uh, screaming subscription service in the world. It's just surpassed 11 million subscribers. It's, it's becoming ubiquitous. The other service was MySpace, which is a service that was started, or the MySpace music service, which was started by the four major labels and the news corporation, who simply didn't understand the value of independent music to, to their marketplace. And they were convinced that, you know, with the four major labels, that was enough music to keep any consumer happy and that if any independent wanted to be on that service, they had to take really terrible commercial terms. 
So at the same time, we were saying yes to one company with Spotify, and we were actually in that business before they even launched. We were saying no, on the other hand, to a service that was clearly didn't understand our business, didn't value our business, and didn't really want to part you know, participate in the growth of, of our business. So I can't see, but I think if I asked anybody to put their hand up who's used MySpace in the last year, I don't think I'm going to see any hands, right? And I'm sure you know, most people have at least looked at Spotify in the last year if not, not using it. And I think those challenges still continue. You know, we, we had an example just last week uh, in Australia, Sony and Universal put together a digital uh, streaming subscription service to be first to market before uh, you know, Deezer and Audio and Spotify and all the other services launched. Again, it didn't do a deal with us because we got a very strong understanding from them that independent music was was off to the side and what really mattered was you know, the fact that Universal and Sony owned, owned this business. I think it lasted nine months and it closed its doors. It closed its doors last week officially, I think having burnt 15 or $20 million of investment. You know, 15 or $20 million that could have been used to, to, to grow a business, so. <laughs> I don't like dancing on graves, but sometimes, you know. Um, you know, and I think the, the other challenge, and I think there's been a lot in the press about the, the challenge that a lot of independents are having with YouTube this year. And, you know, I have to be careful about what I say about that because, you know, we're in business with that company as well and we're, we're trying to, to find a way forward. But, you know, th th there's definitely this, this kind of yin and yang. And I think, you know, back, back to the... the the you know the majors and look and I don't think that this is a major bashing exercise. I really you know at Merlin we firmly believe that a healthy musical ecosystem and a healthy music service is one that, is that offers all the music to everyone all the time in the most attractive way possible. Um, but for that to happen, you know services need to construct their businesses around what the market actually looks like and what consumers are actually doing. We're seeing in our figures, both overall and in terms of the, the way we perform in these services, that we're doing incredibly well in the, in the, in the digital space. The, the, the market shares of our members from the physical to the download market jump by something like 40 to 50%, depending on territory. From the download market to the streaming place, they jump another 12 to 20% which shows that the more the more digital the market gets, the more consumers are enjoying getting to this music because it's there, it's easy, you're not having that experience of walking into the record shop, having seen the band that you really liked in a club last week and just not being able to find their records. I mean, I think as everyone knows, now you can see the most obscure artist anywhere and you'll, you'll find a whole range of information and a whole set of music instantly wherever you are. But, you know, so, so, so these are the counterbalancing forces. I think we're seeing a market that's good, that's rewarding innovation, that is rewarding services that are building towards the future. I think one of the, one of the success, one of the, the unique selling points of Spotify is that it's always been neutral in terms of how it presents its music. There's no shop windows. It's brought independence in from, from day one. You know, Merlin was there from before the service even launched because they knew from all of the consumer research they had done, if they had launched without us, it wasn't going to be as good a product. And, and we know we've got a number of those relationships now. And the services that behave like that are the ones that are seeing the growth and are succeeding and, and, and are going further. And I've given you the two examples of, of, of the ones who haven't. But, but you know, one, one of our concerns here is to, to make sure that as these services come to market, because one thing that happens is as this level of value increases so significantly, and if you think we're earning somewhere around $11 million a month and we're 10% of the market, that must mean the overall industry is earning $110 million a month um, just, in, just in this space. And that level of revenue is going to attract corporate interests who want a piece of that. You know, and I think over the next couple of years we're going to see telephone companies and uh, device manufacturers and all sorts of people coming into the market trying to take a piece of this pie, which should be great news for us all, but it'll be great news for us all if they construct their services in the way that the successful services have, not the ones that are failing and disappearing. And I think there's been a lot of um, uh, discussion and concern you know, within our board, which is represented, which is, rep, you know, represents leading independent labels from around the world, that for 
this to grow into a really sustainable business, we need more services coming in and delivering, you know, substantial and, and, and sustainable, I should say, revenues. But one of the, you know, one of the things that's happening by virtue of the concentration of the music market and by the fact that, you know, the three biggest companies seem to be losing control of consumer behaviour is they're trying to find ways to recreate it, not only as I described by building their own services or making services build products that they think will be good for them, but also by the, the perceptions that create to new entrants in the marketplace. You know, not every company that comes into the digital market wanting to start a service is sophisticated in terms of the depth and breadth of the of the space. You know, they don't know what jungle, uh, uh, who jungle are as an artist, and the fact that they're blowing up in the UK and will probably be a significant artist in the next couple of years. They don't really want to know what genres are brewing in the clubs of Berlin or what's next. They're really just looking at wanting a piece of, of this pie. And then naturally, the first, the first doors they knock on are the doors of the biggest companies, which is, which is natural. And I think if these companies had that level of sophistication and market data to understand what they were entering, uh, we would end up in a much, much healthier space. So, so what I've shown here quickly is, is the, these are figures taken from uh, the Nielsen SoundScan annual um, survey last year. So, so the figures on the left show you what Nielsen SoundScan publishes to the industry. So if you're going to buy a piece of research, that's what you're going to see. You're going to see Universal with uh, almost 40% of the market and Independence with 12% of the market, and your perception is going to be, well, you know, that 12% you know, we'll get to later. But the fact that this, is these figures are compiled on figures that bear no relation to the digital market. And if the digital market's the most healthy and the most growing part of the, of the business, then surely the statistics we're using to educate the marketplace about the shape of the market should relate to that. The thing that amazes me is that Nielsen don't include market shares on any of the US streaming platforms, be it Rhapsody, be it, be it Google Play, be it, be it Spotify. So um, they're also constructing these figures based on physical distribution. So one of the challenges that American independent labels have is it's very difficult to get to the marketplace without going through a major label-owned distributor, be it ADA, um, Red, the directly owned, or companies like The Orchard, which are essentially joint ventures now with major labels and that major labels you know, have invested in. So having those uh, major label entities acting as independent distributors and physical distributors predominantly also means that you can start pulling those market shares in and the market looks like it looks on the left, which is pretty much how the market looked in 1994. On the right is the figures that A2IM, which is the American equivalent of the VUT, uh, did with Billboard magazine at the same period, showing how the market looks if you look at it by ownership and by control of the recordings. And all of a sudden, the independent share goes from the smallest to the largest. So it goes from 12% of the market to 35% of the market. And that's the reality of today's music from an investment point of music industry, from an investment point of view, from an innovation point of view. The biggest sector of the market, even in a, company, in a country like the US that's so dominated by the, the, the biggest companies, is really driving the marketplace. But if you're a digital service coming to the market and you're constructing your value chain towards the, the, the model on the left and not the model of the right, there's going to be disconnects. And that's where we as Merlin um, you know, find the most challenging part is actually getting our, our partners and particularly new partners into the business to understand that you know, consumers don't want a service that's built like the model on the left. They want a service that's built the way the market is today and the way that they behave today with that instant and ubiquitous access. And, you know, and, and there's, there's commercial incentives to, to, to grow this. I mean, I think one of, the, one of the concerning things in the digital space is that increasingly digital licensing deals are not really about royalty rates anymore. It's, there's no whole, it's, there is a wholesale price, but that's only part of the value. You know, there, there's, there's minimum guarantees, there's market share guarantees, there's integration fees, there's technical fees, there's all of these pots of money that sit around the side of these deals 
that depending on where you are and who you're distributed by can disappear into the bottom line of, of the major labels. There's been a lot of talk this year in the, in the music press and then the tech press about breakage, which is essentially money that comes out of these digital deals that's not attributable to, um, you know, to, to, to actual performance. And the easiest way to illustrate that is to, is to use that example of, of Let's stop picking on Universal, but if, if, you know, if we imagine that the pot on the left is not 100%, but $100 million that a company has to invest in the service, and Sony's got 29.5% of that, 29.5% of that money is going to you know, be allocated to Sony at the outset, and 123 to the independents. By the end of the year, once the service is operated, Sony's down to 22%, so there's about $7 million there that is kind of sitting without anywhere to go to. That's not getting passed down to artists, it's not getting, um, you know, it's, it's not getting put back into the ecosystem. What really happens is that the independents end up in a position where they're $20 million worse off than they should be, and you get this unbalanced marketplace. Which, you know, brings us back to why Merlin was created and what we're here to do, is to really use the, 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 the collective importance of what we represent and the value of, the, of the, the labels that we represent around the world and harness the efficiency and, and the, 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 the power of that to make better digital services, to do better, do better business for our members and to make it a healthy music ecosystem, not just for, for us, but, but for, for the industry you know, as a whole. And I think for that to happen, you know, we do need uh, you know, better educated market. We need to have all of our economic incentives better aligned. Uh, we need better education in the market. And that stretches all the way down the line. And I think in, in, in a territory like, like Germany, it's actually using, if you're an independent label, using your trade associations and the connections that they have to the wider world or the people who are involved in the, the global digital market to better understand the nature of it. You know, why is playlisting so successful on, on Spotify? You know, how does a label like Domino, um, which, you know, despite the fact it's had a big hit with, with Arctic Monkeys this year, but, you know, in the physical market as, as quite a niche player, over-index so heavily when it comes to the digital space? And the reason with a label like that, and, and a lot of labels that we're seeing, and, and, you know, including labels, labels and distributors in Germany, that I think have been very early in this path, is because they take the time to understand the model, to see how the model works, and to structure their business around maximising the benefit of it. You know, it really is now, you can put your music anywhere. The challenge is no longer getting your CD into those, you know, six or seven hundred slots that used to exist in the record shop. It's saying, okay, my music is there. How do I get people to listen to it? And the power of playlisting and social media and connections with other artists and all of those tools that are at our disposal um, are creating an enormous amount of success, success stories. And I think, you know, going back to what I said about the way independents are performing in the charts and commercially, it seems to be doing particularly well for, for, for the independent sector. So, you know, so I suppose in closing, much as we have these significant challenges and we're in a turbulent time in the marketplace, you know, certainly from what we've seen from Merlin, not only in the way that the business is growing, but the membership of our organisation is growing because more and more labels and distributors are understanding that to be competitive in the marketplace and to be able to offer your clients and your artists uh, the best possible value, then you know, there are entities out there that can help you properly uh, you know, gain the value of what, what, what you do. You know, and part of that is learning how to say no. Um, I'm, I have teenage children and I, I sort of compare if, if I behaved um, as a, if, if my teenage children behaved like I've seen some independent companies behave over the years, I think we'd be in trouble. And to explain that is, you know, we've seen companies who would just say yes to any digital service that walks in the door. So yes, you know, I don't care if you're paying me 50% of what you pay the majors, I want to be on your service. And yes, you come in. And yes, you come in. And I keep, you know, thinking, if I, if I told my kids that they should say yes to everybody in every single circumstance, I think they get themselves into some pretty substantial trouble pretty quickly. So I always say, you know, it's a sign of maturity to learn how to say no. You have to read the situation. You have to understand who you are, where you fit, what the value of what you represent is. And I think in the digital music space, 
It's complicated, it's difficult, but there's a lot of people out there who can help you. The signs are, are that you know we should be optimistic. Um, I hope if you run an independent label and you're in this room that you're optimistic and that you succeed greatly uh, in this year. Thank you to Oka for inviting me to, to do this and thank you for listening, thanks. I think I said I could take a couple of questions if anybody had questions. Thanks. Sure. So um, the question was about um, a deal that Merlin did very recently uh, with Pandora in the USA. Um, just to give some background on that, I mean, Pandora's or, you know, it's kind of unique in the world of digital music in that it's a non-interactive radio service uh, where you can't sort of choose track by track what you listen to, but you can seed a playlist with a song or an artist and it'll feed you music based on an algorithm that they create that, that um, you know, serves you music that they think you would like. Um, and it, it's, you know, in the US market in particular, has become an enormously important revenue source for independent labels. And I think at the same time, that, you know, we, we've shown you these figures that are, um, you know, very impressive on the on the on-demand streaming side. We've also, in our discussions with Pandora over the years, seen the same dynamic about independents performing particularly well in, in that ecosystem. And that was a difficult deal to do because I think one of the principles that independents really try and uphold and I think on a global basis is, you know, there are statutory licensing bodies such as Sound Exchange in the US that, that, that administers the Pandora deal, um, the PPL in the UK and the GVL here and there's, there's equivalents around the world. And I think for independents those bodies are really important because they establish a fair and, and equal set of remuneration for everybody and they make sure that, that artists get paid. And I think the reason we were particularly pleased with the Pandora deal is that we managed to do a deal that was not only better for our members and gave our members more opportunities within that particular space, but it, it retained the integrity of the uh, relationship between us and the artist and sound exchange. So it hasn't damaged sound exchange in any way and financially they're in the same position. And it also hasn't damaged the, the payments and should actually increase the payments that flow through to artists. I think one of our concerns going back to the land grab and the exploitation of market share is we have already started to see some approaches from services that are traditionally licensed by these collection societies looking to do direct deals. And one of the selling points to the labels is look, under the statutory, under law, we have to pay 50% to the artists and 50% to you. If, you're direct deal, if we do a direct deal with us, we'll pay 100% to you and you can decide whether you pay the artists or not. And again, using this philosophy of trying to build a sustainable ecosystem, you know, we're not going to sustain a business where you know, the creators and the people who are actually you know, making the music that we're, we're putting onto these platforms are, are cut out of the value chain. So, you know, we're really looking forward to see how that, that deal plays out. We're very happy, particularly, that we've managed to preserve those, those principles of fairness and transparency in terms of the way the deal works and, and, and the way it reports. And, you know, we think it's, it's the first, you know, it's the first time we've really been ahead of the curve and ahead of the industry in finding new ways to work with a, a really important partner like that. I think I'm probably out of time. So thank you again, everyone. Thanks very much.